I must now admit that I adapted with remarkable ease to life in my cage. During the day, the monkeys attended to my every need. At night, I shared my litter with one of the loveliest girls in the cosmos. I grew so accustomed to this situation that for more than a month I made no attempt to put an end to it. One day, however, I felt nauseated and blushed at my cowardly resignation. What would Professor Ontel think if he found me in this state? I forthwith made up my mind to behave like a civilized man. While stroking Zira's arm as a gesture of thanks for a sugar lump, I snatched her notebook and pen, sat down on the straw and sketched the system of Betelgeuse, marking Soroa down in its exact position. The effect it had on Zira was extraordinary. Her muzzle turned purple, and she gave a sharp exclamation. Then, in another corner of the sheet, I drew out our dear old solar system with its principal planets. I indicated the Earth and pointed my finger at my own chest. She was flabbergasted and about to draw closer when Zayas appeared at the end of the corridor. Terrified, she quickly crumpled the paper, put her notebook into her pocket, and raised her forefinger to her lips with an air of entreaty. I obeyed her and promptly resumed my intelligent animal attitude. From then on, thanks to Zira, my knowledge of the simian world made rapid progress. She contrived to see me alone every day, instructing me in the simian language, while learning French with amazing rapidity. In less than two months, we were capable of holding a conversation on a variety of subjects. I don't think you realize the danger you are in here on Soror. We were strolling through the park. Zira had consented to this only after much hesitation. It had taken some time for me to convince her of my origin, but she had now begun to work out a plan to liberate me. Meanwhile, my heart was thumping at being in the open air again, albeit naked and on the end of a collar and lead. Zira apologized for this, explaining that even though there were a few tame men who could be taken out without causing a scene, it was more normal if I were on a leash. Now, listen, said Zira. Your launch has been discovered. Our researchers realize it was not manufactured here. What about our spaceship, which has been in orbit around Soror for the last two months? I haven't heard anything. It must have escaped the notice of our astronomers. But you must tell them, Zira, I cried. Why are you hiding me away? Why not reveal the truth to everyone? Zira stopped short, glanced all around her, and put her hand on my arm. Because... Zayas has decreed once and for all that your talents are due to a highly developed animal instinct, and nothing will make him change his opinion. So I'm condemned to spend the rest of my life in a cage? Not if my plan succeeds. In a month from now, we're holding our annual biological conference. Now for us, public opinion is a more powerful element than Zayas. The best thing would be for you to speak up for yourself and make your case. This would cause such a sensation that Zayas wouldn't be able to stop you. And if the others put their foot down? Many of the others are not so stupid as Zayas. And there are also a few chimpanzees whom the Academy has been obliged to admit on account of their sensational discoveries. One of these is Cornelius, my fiancé. He's the only one I've spoken to about you. He has promised to help, but he does want to see you beforehand. That's partly why I've brought you here today. I've arranged to meet him. Cornelius was waiting for us near a bank of giant ferns. He was a fine-looking chimpanzee, older than Zira, but extremely young for a learned academician. Dr. Cornelius of the Academy, said Zira. Ulysse Meru, an inhabitant of the solar system, or to be more precise, the Earth. I am delighted to make your acquaintance, I said. Zira has told me about you. I congratulate you on having such a charming fiancé. So it's true, muttered Cornelius, looking at Zira in utter bewilderment. After a moment's hesitation, he shook my hand. And you really come from... From... From Earth, a planet of the sun. Cornelius started firing questions at me. We were strolling along, the two of them a few paces ahead and arm in arm, myself following on the end of my chain. 
but my replies aroused his scientific curiosity to such a pitch that he would often stop short, let go of his fiancée, and we would embark on a discussion face to face. When he left us, he held out his hand without a moment's hesitation. From then on, Zira took me for outings in the park fairly often. Sometimes we would meet Cornelius, and together we would prepare the speech I was to deliver at the Congress. One day Zira suggested going to the zoo adjoining the park. The first cage at which we stopped contained at least fifty men, women and children, exhibited there to the great glee of the monkey audience. Suddenly, among the herd, I saw none other than the leader and mastermind of our expedition, Professor Ontel. I shuddered at the condition to which he had been reduced. He was among the quiet ones who stretched their hands through the bars with a begging grimace. I should have liked to speak to him, but Zira dissuaded me energetically. After the Congress, she told me, when you have been recognized and accepted as a rational being, we will see about him. The long-awaited date finally arrived. I was taken to a gigantic amphitheater of which every row of seats both around and above me was swarming with monkeys. There were several thousand of them. The guards pushed me towards the center of a circle which resembled a circus arena where a platform had been erected. The tiers of monkeys rose as high as the ceiling. The seats nearest to me were occupied by the members of the Congress, all of them learned scientists, dressed in striped trousers and dark frock coats, all of them wearing decorations, almost all of a venerable age, and almost all orang-utangs. I looked for Cornelius, but could not see him. The President Gorilla rang his bell, and announced he was giving the illustrious Zayas leave to speak. The orang-utan then rose to his feet. He declared that I was capable of a few tricks. Then he picked up a box with nine different fastening systems, such as bolt, pin, key, and hook, it was a test I had completed with ease for Zayas while in my cage. But this time, instead of manipulating the locks, I raised my hand. Then, tugging gently on the lead held by a guard, I approached the microphone and addressed the President. Illustrious President, I said in my best Simeon language, it is with the greatest pleasure that I shall open this box. Before embarking on this task, however... I beg permission to make an announcement. All the monkeys remained glued to their seats, dumbfounded, holding their breath. The president gaped at me. As for Zayas, he seemed to be in a towering rage. Mr. President, he yelled, I protest! But he stopped short, submerged by the ridicule of a discussion with a man. I took advantage of this to go on with my speech. Listen to me, O oh monkeys, for I can talk and not like a mechanical parrot. I can think and I can talk and I can understand what you say. Not only am I a rational creature, but I come from a distant planet, from Earth. I went up to a blackboard and by means of a few diagrams described the solar system and indicated its position in the galaxy. I then embarked on the account of my own adventures. I concluded with the following words. Since I have come to know you, I find you all extraordinarily congenial, and I admire you with all my heart. I have learnt more things in a few months' captivity among you than in all my previous existence. Let us unite our efforts. Let us march forward hand in hand, man and monkey together, and no power, no secret of the cosmos will be able to resist us. I stopped speaking, exhausted, in total silence. I turned automatically to the President's table, picked up the glass of water there, and drained it in a gulp. This simple gesture produced an amazing effect, and was the signal for an absolute tumult. I was deafened by it. Monkeys, who are exuberant by nature, clap with all four hands when they are pleased. Zayas had just risen from his seat in fury. As though in a dream, I saw the vacant chair and collapsed into it, to a fresh burst of applause, which I barely heard before fainting dead away. It was some time before I recovered consciousness. I was lying on a bed in a room, 
Zira and Cornelius were attending to me while some guerrillas in uniform held back a crowd of journalists and curious onlookers. Magnificent, Zira whispered in my ear. You've won! Ulysses, said Cornelius, together we are going to do great things. He told me that the Grand Council of Soror had just held a special meeting and had decided on my immediate release. There were some who opposed it, but public opinion demanded it, and they had to yield. This is where you'll be living. I hope it suits you. I looked round in bewilderment. The room was provided with every comfort. It was the beginning of a new epoch. After hoping so long for this moment, I was suddenly overwhelmed by an odd feeling of nostalgia. My eyes met Zira's, and a rather ambiguous smile came over her face. Here, of course, she said. You won't have Nova with you. I blushed, shrugged my shoulders, and sat up. Do you feel well enough to attend a little party? Zira asked. I replied that nothing would give me greater pleasure, but I was no longer willing to appear stark naked. I then noticed that I was wearing some pajamas. We'll fit you out completely tomorrow, and you'll have a decent suit for this evening. Here's the tailor. A little chimpanzee came in and treated me with great courtesy. In less than two hours, he had succeeded in making me an acceptable suit. It felt quite strange to be wearing clothes again. And Zira looked at me as though she had never seen me before. At the party, it was getting late and I was already tipsy, when the thought of Professor Ontel crossed my mind. Zira asked me why I was looking so sad. I told her. Cornelius then informed me that he had made inquiries about the Professor and there would be no opposition to his release. I vehemently declared that I could not wait a minute longer. After all, Cornelius agreed, one can't refuse you anything on a day like this. Let's go. I know the director of the zoo. Day was breaking when we reached the cage in which the luckless scientist lived like an animal in the midst of fifty men and women. He was stretched out on the ground like the others, huddled against the body of a girl. Professor, I said. Master, it is I, Ulysse Meru. We are saved! I stopped in amazement. At the sound of my voice, he had reacted in the same way as the men of the planet Soror. He had suddenly stretched his neck and shrank away. Professor Antel, I beseeched him, it's I, Ulysse Meru, your traveling companion. I am free, and in a few hours from now, so will you be. These monkeys, you see, know who we are and welcome us like brothers. He shrank back still further. Then, while I stood there trembling, while my heart went numb with horror, Professor Antel gave vent to a long-drawn howl.